Pat Panther. I work with the American Red Cross, specifically on the data and tech team of the International Services, which is a very long-winded way of saying I play with tech people who are much smarter and capable than I am to help translate what they do to people who don't need to understand it. So um, I will, I'm going to talk to you guys today very briefly for 15 minutes uh, about how uh, we have been investing and working with MassWipe over the last year and a half um, as a, an engagement um, for working with both volunteers as well as with our partners. So without further ado, making sure that we're okay. Um, if ever there is a room where I do not need to explain the importance of geospatial data, it's this one. So we will very quickly just touch on a few key uh, aspects of the use of geospatial data specific to humanitarian work um, that we at the Red Cross do along with other humanitarian organizations. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, this is a common site in emergency operations centers. Maps are super important. They tell us where people are. They tell us how to get to people. Um, and they tell us where people have been moving to and from. Um, and geospatial is critical uh, for informing those maps that are made. Um, also recently, we've seen the rise of both forecast-based uh, action and anticipatory action. Um, and these are efforts that allow us to move earlier to uh, based on predictions to mobilize resource before a shock or a crisis hits. Um, and once again, accurate geospatial data is critical and to inform those efforts. And health emergencies, uh, Zika, Ebola, um, COVID, clearly, uh, all are things that benefit from accurate geospatial data to inform contact tracing, the movement of peoples, um, all of which help contribute to mitigating or ending pandemics and epidemics. Which all leads the American Red Cross to being a big fan of OpenStreetMap uh, and have been involved in partnering with them uh, from early days. Um, originally in 2014, American Red Cross was one of the co-founders along with HOT, uh, British Red Cross, and MSF in founding the Missing Maps Project. Again, in the room, I probably don't need to do too much explanation about the Missing Maps Project, but just to put it out there, uh, the, that project has the aim of mapping areas that are not mapped. Um, and we've heard a lot of conversations both yesterday and certainly this morning about the importance of um, people and communities being present on the map. And, and if you're not on the map, you don't get counted. Um, and so it's important that you have that representation. In 2015, a scrappy group of folks, uh, many of whom may be familiar to those here, um, founded MapSwipe. Uh, that was uh, representatives from Highgate, uh, British Red Cross, and again, uh, MSF. And uh, MapSwipe was originally conceived and designed in order to help streamline the projects that were being put on the tasking manager, on hot tasking manager. And so this was, uh, it was being, it's, and it continues to be used as a first pass where you can upload an area of interest and crowdsource people identifying where structures or people, residences, buildings are, which then allows you to better focus the project that is then put into the tasking manager. So you don't have a lot of um, mappers scrolling through vast tracts of um, empty space or empty territory where they can focus and drill down and actually get uh, structures mapped faster and more efficiently. That was the original, what I like to refer to as MapSwipe Classic, which is still classic and still being used today. So for the perspective of the American Red Cross, um, we spent many, many years uh, hosting and supporting mapathons, which would bring um, new mappers and new communities uh, to these hot tasking manager. We were hosting uh, mapping projects based on areas of the world that were of strategic interest to the American Red Cross's work and the Red Cross movement in general. Um, interesting enough, what we discovered as things evolve, as they do, things change. That's the only constant is that things change. Um, there, we did a, a series of evaluations about a year and a half ago about Mapathons in general and kind of the return on, on working with Mapathons. And I think there's going to be a number of common themes that we hear this weekend um, and what, what came out of that. But spoiler alert, uh, we have transitioned um, from doing Mapathons to uh, really working with MapSwipe um, as, as a tool uh, versus getting people mapping directly into the map. So specifically, some of the challenges that we surfaced in that uh, evaluation, again, reaching to the choir a little bit here, I'm sure, um, quality. 
Um, this mapathons tended to be an opportunity for us to bring sometimes first time mappers, frequently only time mappers into the into the space. And while it was a great intro um, and awareness building of, of the importance of open geospatial data and the existence of OSM, um, it's it starts to become challenging to balance that responsible stewardship when you are the one inviting people in and, and building their ability to make edits to the map. And at the same time, you do have that responsibility to, to ensure quality control. And so we were creating a lot of new data and mapping a lot of unmapped spaces. And at the same time, there's this ever increasing load of the need to, to validate that data and make sure that it's actually useful and fit for purpose. So that kind of balance between quality and validation um, became less, less of this and more of that. Um, and then also I think an interesting aspect of the last couple of years, we more and more are seeing um, local communities take responsibility for their own stewardship of their part of the map. And so there's a um, kind of adjacent um, reduction in sort of supply and demand um, when we talk about remote mappers mapping areas versus people who live there who are better able to speak to what's there. Um, and I think a lot of organizations and, and certainly HOT and OSM and other organizations are doing a lot. Youth Mappers is a great example of bringing local communities into that um, activity on the ground where they live. And that that's, that's, is as it should be. Um, so all three of those things sort of got us looking around the landscape. It's like, okay, well, if we're not going to map runs, you know, what's uh, what's out there? And and we knocked on our friend's door who had been playing with MapSwipe and working with MapSwipe. And, and we started to get more heavily involved uh, in MapSwipe. Some of the opportunities that we saw with MapSwipe, it's, it's mobile-based currently, uh, not laptop or computer, browser-based, um, which has pros and cons. We can debate those. Um, but one of the pros is, as someone said earlier today, you know, uh, smartphones are getting more and more ubiquitous. Um, it's easy to use. People are already familiar with the sort of um, physical components of, of engaging with it. Working with MapSwipe projects uh, on your phone is wildly easy to figure out how to do. There is very little barrier to, to learning or engagement. Certain projects are a little tougher. You're going to hear about one right after I speak, which was brilliant of us to not coordinate, but end up coordinating. So uh, Miriam will be following up with a MapSwipe project in more detail. Um, but most importantly, I think from the quality control perspective, there's no direct interface or edit back with OSM at this point. It is creating an analysis layer, which then can be um, uh, part of the data output, which can then be integrated into another platform or for another use, either for product, or in the case of poor mapping, we could extract uh, what is badly mapped and put it back into the tasking manager to be remapped by perhaps more advanced mappers if it's a difficult area to map, say, dense urban area. Um, so the, all of these components led us to uh, engaging more directly with the MapSwipe community and with MapSwipe itself. And so currently, just for those who are unfamiliar, and by the way, while I'm talking, feel free to go to the App Store of choice and download MapSwipe if you have not already. Uh, that will give you something to do on your phone. Um, there are three current types of projects. Uh, find, compare, validate. Find is a nice single marketing one word way of talking about MapSwipe Classic. So that's where you are pushed six tiles. Um, to assess where an object is or is present in any of those tiles, kind of like the capture that we're all familiar with. Um, and so that helps determine where things are. So anything that is visible from satellite imagery, you can have people look for. So that could include uh, infrastructure, buildings, certainly, uh, ponds, um, and, and other items that are currently MapSwipe is only uh, able to support satellite imagery, but there is an ongoing conversation about exploring um, other image sources, such as uh, street level or drone. So that's an exciting area to further explore. Compare is uh, also known as change detection. So that's sort of a before and after where users are pushed to images before and after. Um, and that has been used in, in a couple different uh, ways, which I'll share in a minute. Um, but essentially that allows the um, organization who's hosting that project to better determine where change has occurred. And uh, the validation, uh, hold your thought on validation. Uh, I'll get back to that one. But essentially that one was originally configured to pull in existing mapped data and then have users crowdsource assessment of whether that data is accurate. So is it a good footprint? Um, is it a bad footprint? Um, does it need to be remapped? There's some issues with that um, particular project type which are currently 
being reconfigured, which I'm excited about. Um, so we'll come back to that in a little bit when we talk about what's next. Um, specific examples for each of these. Um, one of the cool ones that just recently happened for the fine, um, there was a nonprofit in India who was very keen to identify where ponds were uh, for inland farmers in order to make available opportunities to stock fish as an income generation uh, project. And they had spent quite a bit of time essentially scrolling through Google Earth to find ponds. And as you can imagine, this was taking a tremendous amount of time. Um, they reached out to the Hot Asia Pacific Hub, uh, and someone there was familiar with MapSwipe, and we all got together and had a little chat. And we ended up um, customizing the find project type, um, put up a, a project for them, and they have a video out, which is, um, I'll, I'll share the link if anyone's interested. It's, it's, it's quite, quite fun and enthusiastic. Uh, two minutes, um, but they, in about three weeks, were able to identify 8,500 ponds, um, and so that turnaround time was, was quite remarkable um, as, a, as a result. Um, for Compare MSF, last February, uh, Madagascar got hit by almost simultaneously two different um, cyclones, and they put up a project uh, for change detection where they um, had before, they had access to the satellite imagery before and after, and had people assess where um, there was visible flood damage, and then were able to turn that project around fairly quickly in order to inform um, field maps, which were sent out with teams to better prioritize and mobilize resources to get to more of those um, affected areas. Um, wish I had a case study for Validate. I don't. Catch me next year. Um, but so what's next? Um, we want to do all the things, but we don't have the people or the resources all the time. So what we decided to do, we embarked on earlier this year, was a, a stakeholder analysis interview process. And many, many Miro post-its were gave their at best in this effort. Um, but we really just wanted to sort of download all of these people's brains who are engaged with MapSwipe, either behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, hosting missions, swiping on, mis um, not missions, projects. Um, and where we sort of landed after uh, a deal of, discussion and analysis for identifying some top priorities. Um, obviously, the reason MapSwipe exists is to have data outputs. Um, and so we want to revisit how those outputs are being configured so that they are, um, and also the, the API, so that they are better um, portable to the next home they go to. Uh, for example, uh, one of the projects just recently was uh, um, for building validation is trying to figure out a better workflow for that. So. Um, MSF puts uh, one of those outputs up onto a map roulette for to have things be remapped. So that's an example of what comes out of MapSwap going somewhere else in order to either correct the data or have it be remapped. Um, the technical team um, is a challenge. Um, MapSwap is volunteer managed, led, run. Um, and so you have some, some very committed people who are giving extra time um, and so wanting to make sure that we expand that a little bit to be a little bit more sustainable from the tech side. Um, and then uh, things like refreshing the website to better tell the story and how people can engage, overhaul and tutorial creation. Each project has a tutorial, but it's really technically complicated to adapt. Um, and so we wanna make that a little bit more user-friendly for some more people to be able to engage with MapSwipe for, for, for project use. Um, and then, as I said, multiple times, fixing the validation mission uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, what's next, next, next? Uh, some of the things, and none of these I'm sure will be new to this audience, um, new project types. We've been looking at um, completeness as a piece of the puzzle um, for what data is out there. Obviously AI and machine learning is part of the conversation. Um, we have both sides represented in the community. There's the AI machine learning, and then there's the, no, we need to not do this. And so it's, it makes for fun by weekly phone calls. Um, but all that to say, um, I think MapSwipe is an interesting tool in that it has the human component built in, but it is designed in a way that could easily help inform um, training machine learning sets, but with humans actually doing the, this is a building, this is not a building, because of course, it, the power of the model rises and falls on how it's trained. Um, and so a, res a, a building, a residential building in rural R Rwanda is going to look very different from what it looks like in Brazil. So having those uh, machine learning uh, models be locally relevant, I think, is a, is a piece to unpack. Um, damage assessments, obviously, that's clear from the compare project type. 
Um, one of the things that I do want to touch on the user activation is currently there's no in-app messaging, either one way or, or, or two way. Um, and one of the things that's come up certainly from the humanitarian side of, of the conversation is finding out if there's ways that we can better activate our user base in order to turn and complete projects in a more timely fashion. So um, right now, the, the projects that are on there are not necessarily time bound, uh, but there are certainly examples of moments where if you could get a couple hundred users to um, work through and complete uh, a project in 24 hours, um, that kind of changes the landscape a little bit for how um, certainly humanitarian organizations might be able to, to use and adapt the tool. And of course, web-based is a frequent question. Um, Hygit is actually experimenting with a web-based version, but that's a longer conversation than I have time for today. So uh, we would love to have more people get involved. Uh, here's how you can. Um, if you need more links, come see me. Um, we have uh, GitHub uh, where there's plenty of issues for those of you who have the skills to address some of them. Uh, we would welcome any and all to our wildly amusing bi-weekly phone calls. Um, come, come make some new friends um, or see some old friends because I'm sure you know many of the usual suspects. Uh, we have a Slack workspace, um, and of course, if you're an organization who is interested in perhaps exploring how MapSwipe as a tool could be operationalized in your data pipelines, we would love to explore new use cases as well. So, that's me.